Hello, everyone. We're going to get started with a review of functions. So I'm going to go uh, a little bit more quickly through this than I would a normal lecture, just since it's review. There's also just a lot of graphs and, and pretty quick examples anyway, so it kind of lends itself to, to going a little bit faster than usual. But let's go ahead and get started. We will look at the definition of a function. So a function is a relation between x and y. So you got two variables, x and y, and every x has to correspond to exactly one y. And now don't, don't get tripped up by this. You're allowed to have y correspond to multiple x's, and we'll see some examples of that. But you just have to have every x corresponding to exactly one y. And so we're going we're gonna to keep coming back to this definition as we, as we see graphs and we see functions and we see examples. Um, it's very easy to, to get tripped up when you're looking at a graph and think, oh yeah, that's a function. But if you always come back to this definition, it shouldn't steer you wrong. So let's go ahead and, and look here. So we've got this nice line right here, and I want to know if that's a function. Well, we've probably seen before, yeah, lines are functions. We just kind of know that off the top of our head. But using that definition, Every single x coordinate that I could come up with, do those each correspond to just one y value? And it, to me, it looks like they do. It looks like every x is associated with exactly one y. And that's actually what, what kind of makes it a line. Um, so yeah, this, this would be a function. Let's go ahead and put a big yes there. This is a function. Let's move on here. And this is actually a good example of what I talked about back on that definition slide. Is this a function? And so you could look at this and you might initially be like, oh, well, look, you've got this, you've got this value here and there's two, there's two points here. So, so that doesn't work. It's not a function. But that's not what the definition says. It's actually the opposite of the definition. The definition says that every x corresponds to exactly one y. So if I pick an x down here and I move up to where the y is, there's only one y that that corresponds with. If I pick an x here and I move up, there's only one y that that corresponds with. Now, I could, I could sort of do this the opposite way. I could pick a y first. This isn't, this isn't, this isn't sort of the incorrect way to think about this. I could pick a y first and I could say, yeah, there's two x's that correspond to that y, but that's not the definition of, the, of a function. That's, that's fair game for us. So this would be a function. It's gonna be like a, like a y equals x squared parabola. Let's keep going. Is this a function? And here you're probably looking at after that last slide, you're going, no, 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 this is definitely not a function. Because look, if I have x equals two, that x corresponds to two different y's. So you can't tell me exactly one y value that, that comes about if you start off at x equals two. So this is not a function here. Got a circle here. And again, for the same reason, I can use that x equals two example again. There's two different y values that correspond to that x. And so this, this would not be a function for the same reason as before. Now here we've just got the top half of a circle. Now this, this would work, right? Because it, similar to that parabola, there's, there's only a singular y for these x values that I pick. So if I pick an x and I move up to wherever the y is, I only get one y value possible for each of those x's. So this would be a function. Now, if I take the right half of the circle, again, this, this doesn't work, right? If I take that line x equals two, if, if I pick x equals two and I say, hey, where are my y values? Well, there's two of them. There's two y values right there. And so I can't, I can't say that each x corresponds to exactly one y value. So this would not be a function. Now, this is easy when we're doing this graphically, but if I give these examples to you algebraically, now what do we do? You know, now is this, is this easy to deal with? And kind of remember what I just said, it's easy to do these graphically. So the I think the best way to answer 
this question, you know, are these functions is to actually graph these. You know, if I, if I just graph y equals x squared, then I get something like that. And I go, yeah, that's a function that works. And then if I graph one over X, I can, you know, I can keep going on and I can keep doing this graphically. It's hard to do this with, with just algebraically. You could just plug and chug a bunch of X's and see if it's ever possible to get out two different Y's. Um, and I'll, I'll show an example of that on this fourth one, but let's, let's just keep going through this sort of idea of graphing these as a method of, of getting these, uh, as a method of answering these questions. So let me, let me go ahead and just graph one over X over here. All right, so if we graph one over X, hopefully we, remind, we remember that it looks something like this and we've got a nice asymptote right here at x equals zero. And if we look at this, that asymptote can, can sort of trip us up. It, it, makes it, it makes it seem like, oh no, this isn't a function. Like it's not even connected, but that's actually a whole different topic. That's continuity and we'll get to that later in the course. But this actually is a function because any x value that you pick, if you pick an x here, it corresponds to just a, just a singular y. It doesn't matter where, where my x is. I only have one y that corresponds to each of them. And so this actually is a function. Now, we've got this, this square root guy here, y equals square root of one plus x. And hopefully we remember that the square root function looks like kind of a parabola turned on its side. Now, however, I have one plus X. So this is actually shifted just a little bit to the left. And that's still fine. That doesn't change whether or not it's even a function. Um, it's just shifting it a little bit. So if we look here, I've got an X that I could pick and I look at it and I go, hey, there's a Y, boom. And if you do that for any X value, you're just always gonna happen to see that there's one Y and only one Y that corresponds to it. So this is a function. Now this last example, um, hopefully you can, you can remember that this is just the equation of a circle of radius one. And you could tell that that's not a function in that case. But if you didn't recognize that as being the equation of a circle, we could do this algebraically. And let me, let me add another page here and we'll actually go ahead and do this. So algebraically, I can start off here and let's just solve for Y like we usually do when we have um, equations that, you know, equations of functions and they're not solved out already. We like to just solve them for Y. And here's, here's where you want to be careful. I'm going to square root both sides here so that that Y squared just becomes a Y. But when I introduce that square root, I have to put a plus or minus in front of it. And that plus or minus is huge. That's exactly what tells us that this is not a function. Because if you plug in an X value in here, then you're going to get two different Y values, right? And let's, let's just do, let's do an example here. Let's actually take y of one half. So if I do that, I have plus or minus one minus one half squared. So I still have my plus or minus one minus one fourth. One half squared is one fourth. I have my plus or minus three fourths. And then if I just simplify that, radical, I get root three over two, but I still have a plus or minus. And so what you've seen here is that if I, if I choose Y equals one half, I get two different values. I get plus root three over two and minus root three over two. And, and that's bad. That's exactly what we don't want for a function. So you could see here, not a function. 
so if that graphic graphical sense of looking at things didn't didn't make you know if it didn't work for you then you could do this algebraically and you could see that it's not a function all right let's go ahead and look at a function here um we're kind of done looking at oh is this a function or not this is a function what i've got written down i you know you can take that for granted or or think about it and graph it if you'd like. It's a fairly simple function to graph. Let's go ahead and find f of seven and f of one. So I'll go ahead and start working this out. We're just gonna plug in seven where we have an x. So nine plus square root of seven minus three equals nine plus square root of four. Square root of four is two add those together and we get our 11. And that's great. We've got we've got our point 7 comma 11. That's fantastic. Let's go ahead and and do f of 1 here. So 9 plus square root instead of an x I'm going to put a 1. 9 plus square root of negative 2 and at this point we get scared and we freak out and we run away because we have a negative underneath a radical, and we can't have that. Um, we're not dealing with imaginary numbers um, in calculus. We're just we're just dealing with real numbers. So we don't we don't want to put any i or anything in here. This is bad. This this does not work. We don't we don't like this. And so this lends this lends us to the question. Okay, I've got this function. What x values am I even allowed to plug in? I plugged in one and, and it just didn't work. It didn't give me anything. It didn't give me a number, right? It gave maybe some, maybe an imaginary number, but it didn't give me a real number. And so if we ask ourselves this question, you know, what values of X are we even allowed to plug in? That actually lends us to this idea of domain. And I'll get to a definition of domain in just a second. Let's sort of think critically at what I could plug in. And really the only issue here with this function is in this square root. And so when I look at this square root, I'm realizing, hey, I don't want, I don't want to have a negative underneath that square root. So basically what I just said there, I don't want to have a negative underneath the square root. I can rewrite that as x minus three has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because if x minus three is greater than or equal to zero, then I won't have a negative underneath that square root because I'm, I'm stating that that x minus three is zero or positive. So if I simplify this down, I could add three to both sides and I get x is greater than or equal to three. And that's actually what values of x were allowed to plug in. You could, we would probably write this in a slightly different way. I think most people would be comfortable with using interval notation. So using that hard bracket to indicate that I'm including three and then going up to infinity with that soft bracket or parentheses, if you will. And you could also use this sort of set notation. And if you're not familiar with this, we'll read this off as X such that x is greater than or equal to 3, and these brackets indicate that it's the set of those numbers. So again, just, just pointing this out, this vertical bar means such that. That's just sort of math lingo there. All right, so we've seen here we've got this function, and we just kind of intuitively thought about this, and we've said, hey, x has to be 3 or, ba or bigger in order for this, this thing to work. Otherwise, we get an imaginary number, and we don't like that. So the domain of a function, we generally denote it with this sort of script D, this fancy D. The domain of a function, it's the set of all X's that give you a real number for Y. And we saw that here, that was three up to infinity. If you plug in any of those numbers in for X, you get out a real number for Y. If you plug in anything less than three, then you get an imaginary number and we don't want that. So that's domain right there, we've got that definition down. And now that we have that, we can, we can think about the range of a function. And this can be harder to do, especially if you don't have a graph. It's hard, it's hard to just look at the function and think about it. But what you could do in theory is you could take everything in your domain and you could plug it in to the function and see what you get out for y. And that gives you your whole 
sort of range of Y values that you could have, that gives you your range. There's other things that you can do as well with range where you can look at this function, you can say, okay, I know that a square root, what this square root part, this has to be zero or bigger. It has to yield something that's positive because you've, you've never, never in your life have you taken a square root and, and gotten a negative output because the square root function doesn't do that. If we, you know, if we look at a graph of it, let me go ahead and do this on a new page. So if we look at f of x equals nine plus square root of x minus three, if we, if we graph the square root function, we're gonna get something that looks like this, right? And the output there, the y, is always bigger than, z. it's always zero or bigger. And, and so that's exactly what I was saying. You've never taken a square root and then gotten something negative. So when I'm looking at this function up here and I'm trying to determine the range, I know that this portion here is going to be at least zero. It's not going to be smaller than zero. So I'm taking something that's at least zero and then I'm adding nine to it. So this whole thing is going to be at least nine. It could be bigger, obviously, if that green portion was seven, then you know we're obviously gonna add nine to that and we're gonna be larger than nine. But this whole thing is at least nine. And right there, we've actually found the range right there. Got our script R. The range is going to be nine and it just is gonna go up to infinity because you could, that green part that I've got boxed, that could be huge. That could just be anything, right? anything positive or zero. So that gives us our range. We like that. We've got a, we've got a great, great answer there. And let's go ahead and move on. So with domain, you can, you know, you can graph things to your, to your heart's content. You can do algebra, you can think about it intuitively, but generally there are three times that we encounter domain restrictions that we that we have problems with functions and that's if you have division by zero so that'll happen if you have like a one over x if you have a negative inside of a square root which will happen if you have a square root in your function or if you have a, a negative logarithm so if you take the log of something negative that's also bad now let me be clear you could mix these these you know i could give you something you know, really ugly. And I could say, hey, here's a function f of x equals one over log of the square root of x. And there's just a whole, I'm mixing off three of those, right? I can't divide by zero. I can't have a negative in my log and I can't have a negative underneath that square root. And so that can lead itself to a lot of restrictions on our domain. So in, in practice, these are pretty much the three ways that you're going to have domain restrictions. It's not, it's not all of the ways. There are obviously more. If we were dealing with trig functions in this class, which we aren't, uh, then, you know, you would have, um, you know, you would have restriction, more restrictions there. But the, for us, these are pretty much the three restrictions that we're going to have. All right. So we've seen some, we've seen some graphs of these already. I've, I've kind of talked about each of these at least briefly. So we've got, we've got common function types that we're gonna be looking at. And those are linear, parabolic, square root, an inverse, an exponential, and a logarithmic. And we've got equation, you know, sort of baseline equations here. The, the letters A, B, C, and D, those are just constants. And obviously they can change, you know, a line, you know, you can have different slopes and different intercepts, you know, you can have different coefficients on your parabola. So these are the A, B, C, and D are just ways to show how I can sort of shift and manipulate these functions, um, shift and stretch and, you know, all of that fun stuff. But these are our baseline um, equations for these. That exponential, a lot of times, this value of B is, is uh, E, that, that letter E that's, that's kind of sneaky, that's, it's like pi, it's like just a number, 2.71828. It doesn't have to be E though, it could be seven or it could be two, um, it could be a whole bunch of things. 
And same thing with this Z here. A lot of times this constant Z, this base Z, that's, that's sometimes E. A lot of times it is, but it, it doesn't have to be. It can be anything else. And we'll get more into those later. We'll see some examples. So let's go ahead and just look really quickly. I'm not going to bother with a line. We know what lines look like. Parabola, the standard parabola, x squared. We got this. We got these points here. We've got 1, 1. We've got 2, 4. We've got 3, 9. We should be comfortable with this. We've seen this before. We've got that square root function. Sort of just take that x squared and flip it on its side. We've got 1, 1. We've got 4, 2. And we've got 9, 3. Notice that I don't have a plus or minus in front of here. If I did have a plus or minus, I would have to bring the function down this way, but I don't have that plus or minus, so we don't bring the function down that way. We've got the inverse function, one over x. I, I graphed this earlier. We've got, our, we've got our asymptote that goes right down the middle here. x equals zero doesn't yield a y value because you'd be dividing by zero and that's bad. Exponential here, I've chosen to graph e to the x. So I, I, I've chosen you know, my base to be e here. You don't have to though, you could have two to the x, you could have seven to the x, you could have 100 to the x. Um, that'll change the shape of the graph, but, um, or ex excuse me, that'll change details of the graph, but the overall shape will stay the same. And so here, one important thing to note is the y-intercept there at zero comma one. And another important thing to note is an asymptote down there. The way that this function is graphed, it kind of looks like if I zoom in here. Let's go ahead. Yeah, if I, if I zoom in right there, you can see it kind of looks like that function is that red is touching the axis, but it actually doesn't. There's an asymptote there. I think it's just super, super close. So it looks like it's it's touching, but it doesn't. So that's all good. That's all fine and dandy. We got our exponential with our asymptote there. Here I've chosen to graph log base two of X. Again, I could graph log base E of X. I could graph log base seven of X. I could graph log base 100 of X. I can change that base if I want to. Just a, just a note here, if I do log base E of X, we generally abbreviate that with LN. We'll call that the natural log. That's just, a, it pops up often enough that we give it a shorter name so we don't have to write log base E every time. Again, we've got this um, x-intercept at one comma zero. And again, notice this kind of shape here. It looks, it looks like that, that exponential function did, but just kind of flipped, just kind of turned on its side, if you will. Right, so that was that exponential, and you can see it's kind of like a mirror image right there, and that's actually because they are inverse functions. Awesome, so we got logarithmic there, and let's actually jump back to lines just for a, a brief moment. We'll talk about slope intercept form, we've seen this before. We've got our slope m and our y intercept at zero, comma b. One thing I'm very picky about is not saying, or excuse me, one thing I'm very picky about is, is when people say, oh, the y-intercept is at b. Now, you got to say that it's at zero comma b, because just saying b, that's not a, that's not a point on the graph. Zero comma b is that y-intercept. Awesome. Given that, um, you know, we have a slope-intercept form where our slope is just given to us, what if we don't have a slope intercept form, right? What if we just looking at a graph of a line and we're trying to figure out the equation of it? Well, if you can find two points that are on that line, and I'm gonna call those points x1, y1, and x2, y2, you can calculate that slope by just doing rise over run, right? So this is your, your y2 minus y1 over your x2 minus x1. That's that rise over run. Awesome. So. Just doing a quick example of that, if I give us this line right here, you can see that there's the point two comma three on this top end and the point negative three comma negative two on the bottom end. If I do my rise over run here, 
you got to be very careful. I've chosen these numbers so that they're, they look kind of confusing and, you know, they're the same numbers just with some negatives and they're flipped. You got to be very careful with your algebra in here when you're doing, you know, three minus negative two and all that. You see that the slope is one here. And obviously on our graph, we can see that our rise over run is one, 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 one. We're just sort of stepping up one over and one up every time. So that's, that works out. Awesome. Another form of a line instead of slope intercept form, I actually think this form is more useful because you don't always have the intercept of a, of a line, but you definitely know a point on that line. And that's what we call point slope form. So if I give you a line and we have a, and I give you the slope and I give you a point X naught comma Y naught, then you can write it in this format and it's the, it is the same, it ends up being the same exact thing as slope intercept form. Um, and, and that's just another way to talk about the equation of a line. Awesome. Now that we've talked about lines, let's, let's move on to parabolas. And we'll look at sort of parts of the parabola. Standard form is going to be this ax squared plus bx plus c. So you've got these constants a, b, and c that can change. And given that you have this form, the vertex of the parabola, that x coordinate is at negative b over 2a. So just looking at these coefficients tells you what that x coordinate is. And then for the y coordinate of the vertex, I just put a question mark here. Because basically all you're going to do is once you get the x value, you're going to plug that in to the function and just get out a y value. So if I wanted to, I could write this. I could say this question mark is f of negative b over 2a. I just think that kind of looks cumbersome and it looks awkward. So um, I generally just like my like, question mark. And then, hey, you know that you just got to find the y value. Like you always find y values. Just take the x and plug it in. In this standard form as well, we have a y-intercept given by this value of c. So that's a y-intercept at 0, comma c. And if I wanted to find an x-intercept, I do what I always do. I set y, this f of x, equal to 0, and I solve for x. So if I do that, if I, if I set this equal to 0 and I solve for x, I'm probably going to have to do some factoring, right? And that'll give us our x-intercepts. Um, we can have multiple x-intercepts. You could have none. You could have one. Um, it just depends on the parabola. And then for the direction that the parabola opens up, it'll open upwards if A is greater than zero, and it'll open downwards if A is negative. And so that's that leading coefficient that you've probably heard people talk about. So let's go ahead and do an example of, of a vertex here, finding the vertex of the parabola. So I've got this 3x squared minus 12x plus 7. And as we said, the vertex it was at that negative b over 2a. And then I'm just going to take that and I'm going to evaluate that in the function. Let's just find the x-coordinate first. So negative b over 2a, I have negative, negative 12. So that value of b is negative 12. a is 3. So I get 12 over 6, which gives me 2. And there we go. We've got the x coordinate of our vertex right there. Let's change that color. There we go. Sweet. Now that I have that x coordinate, I can actually go ahead and I can find f of 2, and that's going to give me the y coordinate. So I just plug in 2 everywhere I see an x. And if we work this out, we're going to get 12 minus 24 plus seven, which is gonna be negative five. And so we end up getting the vertex at two, negative five. And that's our, that's our answer for that vertex. Pretty, pretty quick math right there. It's not, not, too, not too intense. Um, so that should, be, that should be fairly straightforward. I'll skip over, I got the work here that I just did. Vertex, awesome. Exponentials. So what, what I just sort of want to talk about here um, for a second is this 
this idea of C and A and how they can change. So as you change the value of C, that actually will change the Y intercept. As you change the value of A, that's going to change sort of how steep this, this is. Um, as, as A gets bigger, it'll get steeper because your exponential is growing faster and faster. Um, as you increase C, like I said, that Y intercept will move up here. Awesome. So one thing that I really want to call out is, I mean, this is just al simple algebra here, but a lot of people seem to mess this up. Negative exponents do not produce a negative value. So a lot of people see two to the negative five and they go, oh, okay, two to the five is 32. So two to the negative five is negative 32. And that's not, that's not what happens. When you have two to the negative five, when you have a negative exponent, that's the same as writing one over the positive exponent. So we got to turn this into that fraction one over two to the fifth, then two to the fifth is equal to 32. So we get one over 32. This should, this, this tells us here that if I have an exponential, it doesn't matter what a is. It doesn't matter whether I have a negative up here in the exponent. This is always positive. And you can see that on this graph here, right? This graph is always positive. It's always above, it's always above the X axis. There's nothing down here. I didn't even include the, the graph down, you know, the axes down there because there's nothing down there. The graph is always positive. And then again, similar sort of math. If you have the base of your exponential as a fraction, you can sort of, I don't know if I'd want to use the word distribute, but you can, you can sort of bring this five onto both parts. So I'm going to take one to the fifth and I'm going to divide that by two to the fifth and I get one over 32 here. And notice here that what, I, what I've actually done let me let me do a new a new slide here. I've actually written out I wrote 2 to the negative 5 and I got 1 over 32 and then I wrote 2 to the excuse me I wrote 1 half to the fifth and I got 1 over 32. So these are actually the same thing. These are actually equal. Just kind of a, a little note there. Awesome. So we saw um, with parabolas that that value of a, that, uh, that leading coefficient, that gave us sort of the direction of whether it opened up or opened down. Here, it's not quite a leading coefficient, but it is the value of that letter a, that, that base of the exponent. If that base is greater than one, then our exponential increases, if you will, it, it sort of, it, faces in this direction. And if the value of A is in between zero and one, it faces in this direction, right? Kind of looks like an L sort of shape here. And that's, that's sort of just that value of A. So with exponential functions, probably the most, um, the most important and the most used example here is going to be uh, compound interest and or or just or just even just interest in general. And so we can use this x this form of the exponential function. Notice I've got my e here as my base. I have time as my uh, variable. And then I've got other constants p and r. And p stands for how much money you start with. We call that principal. So that's the initial amount of money that you start off with. R is your annual interest rate. So it's, you know, you, you go to the bank and they say, hey, we'll give you a 3% interest rate. And this formula here tells you how, how much money you'll have after a certain amount of time. So let's do an example here. If I invest $10,000 at a rate of 8% per year, I wanna find the value of that investment after 40 years. And what you'll see is this is actually a lot of money. Uh, this is kind of my way of telling people, hey, start investing because money grows quickly if you do it right. So I have my formula A equals P E to the RT. I'm going to plug in for P and R and T. I've got 10,000 E to the 
R is 8%. So I'm going to write that as 0 0.08. And then T is 40. And if you actually work this out, um, I'm not going to go through with the steps here because um, I don't have you know, a calculator with me. Uh, but if you did all this out on a calculator, you get 245325 dollars and 30 cents. So if you just took $10,000 right now and you, you invested it at 8% a year and you did absolutely nothing, you end up with almost $250,000 at sort of retirement time. That's, that's pretty awesome. I, I kind of like that. that that's, that's a great example of how, um, you know, of how we can, you know, invest our money and, and, you know, save up for retirement. Um, awesome. Let's, let's go ahead and, and continue on with some uh, logarithms. So I'm going to skip through this work here. I just did all that. So we got a, a logarithm here. Let's say that I give you y equals two to the x. I want us to solve for x if y equals eight. And and we've we've done this with other problems, you know, before where, you know, you're I instead of me giving you an x and having you solve for y, I'm giving you a y and having you solve for x. And so we're just kind of doing it backwards. So if I take that y equals eight and I plug it in for y, I end up with this equation here eight equals two to the x. And you can probably look at that and tell that the answer is three because two to the third is equal to eight. But if it was more complicated or you didn't know that off the top of your head, the step here, the algebraic step to go from an exponential to just the x is to take the logarithm. And so if I take the log base two of both sides, then here, that log base two of two to the x, these two sort of cancel, if you will, and I'm left with just my x. And I, at that point, I take log base two of eight. You could use a calculator. Hopefully, you can you know that that's equal to three without the use of a calculator. Um, if you don't, practice some logarithms. And at that point, boom, we've got x equals three, and that's our answer. And so just just sort of using talking about this this log uh, this logarithm a little bit more if i write down log base a of b that's this right here that i just verbalized log base a of b that's asking a raised to what power gives me b and this power that's the answer to this logarithm that's that value so if we do an example here, if I say, okay, I've got log base four of 16, and I want to know what that is. Okay, I ask myself, four raised to what power gives me 16? So in this case, A is four and B is 16. So four raised to what power gives me 16? Well, four to the second power is 16. So this value is just two. And then I can do another example here. Nine raised to what power gives me three? And that's a little bit trickier, but you can hopefully come up with one half, right? If I take the square root of nine, I get three. And that square root is the same as a one half power right there. So that's gonna give me that answer there. Let's do let's do one more example here. Let's say I gave you log base 1.034 of 1.034 to the x. And this looks a lot more complicated, but let's just ask ourselves this question. 1.034, that's our a, raised to what power gives me 1.034 to the x, which is our b, right? So let me let me write that out. I'll write that out over here. I I just said verbally. I'll, I'll verbalize it again, and I'll and I'll say it. I'll write it out mathematically. 1.034 to the what power equals 1.034 to the x, and I want to know what that power is. Well, when I'm looking at it, I'm just I just kind of match it up, and I say, hey, well. It's X. And so 
this logarithm is actually just x. And that's that sort of cancellation that, we, that we've seen before, that we saw on the last slide, actually. So there's some examples of logarithms. That's, that's all fine and dandy. Uh, we like it. Let's go ahead. I just did those there. Let's go ahead and look at one more compound interest example. So let's say I invest $6,000 in a bank account. So that's my principal amount. Let's go ahead and write that down. I'll just, I'll, I'll just put a P here, P next to 6,000. In a bank account with 4% interest, that's gonna be my R. How many years, that's gonna be time, and I don't know what it is, because I'm asking for that. How many years will it take for me to have $9,000? Well, that 9,000 is that A, right? I've got A equals P E to the R T. And so that's that 9,000, that's that final amount that I ended up with. So I've got 9,000 equals 6,000 E to the 0 0.04 T, again, changing that 4% for R into a decimal. So, you can see here, sort of looking ahead, I, I have a t in my in my exponent. I have I have a, a variable in that exponent, so I'm going to have to do a a logarithm here. I'm going to have to take a logarithm of both sides. I've already got this work shown out here, so let's go ahead and just step through it. It'll it looks a little neater than how I can write it. So I've got this 9,000 equals 6,000 e to the 0.04 t. That's exactly what I just had on that last slide. I can divide both sides by this 6,000 and I basically move it over. If I do 9,000 divided by 6,000, that just gives me 1.5. That's just nine divided by six, right? I can cancel these zeros, if you will. So again, nine divided by six, that's just that 1.5 e to the 0.04 t. And like I said, we've got a t in the exponent here. So I, I have to take a logarithm in order to answer this. So I wanna take a log with a base of e because that's my base there. So I take log base e of both sides. And when I do that on the left side, I just get log base e of 1.5. That's, that's all good, that's, that's fine. We can leave that written like that. When I take that log base E of this side, that cancellation happens again. The E's sort of cancel. I can write that out. I'm taking log base E of E to the 0.04 T. So I'm, I'm asking myself, E raised to what power is E to the 0.04 T? Well, it's 0.04 T right there. Those E's are sort of just canceling, if you will. So now that I've got this 0.04 t right here, I can divide both sides by that 0.04. I can bring it over there. And at that point, we've got our answer. It doesn't look very nice, but you could, that, that's an answer. That's, that's the exact answer there. You could plug it into a calculator and if you wanted to, and you'd get 10.1366 years. So it takes you a little more than 10 years to go from 6,000 to $9,000. Um, yeah, and that's actually it on the function review. I know that was a lot there, so take your time, you know, combing through this lecture. Um, we'll we'll get started with um, more calculus next time.